Uh, good evening. Uh, first of all, thank you very much for inviting me to come here uh, and to talk about one of the topics that gets me most excited. I am very often a quiet person that doesn't talk a lot, um, but if there is one topic that gets me you know, up and raise my voice is open science or open research. And in particular, the position that early career researchers have in, in this issue. So when I talk about early career researchers, I don't mean young people. Um, I mean people that actually do the research. You know, those that get their hands dirty, PhDs, postdocs, but even faculty that are early in their career. It's pretty much everybody but the professors. Those that do the actual work, not the managers. <clears throat> open science, open research is a topic of general interest. You know, everybody has to contribute. But the early career, career researchers, and I certainly am an early career researcher, we have a central position because we do the research, but we are those that suffer from this unwelcoming and unethical research environment. Um, um, the slides are available online, so this URL here will uh, open this presentation, but the slides are not really uh, interesting. They are just a little summary. On this second uh, link here, I have a rather long blog post that talks about what I want to share with you today in much greater length than I have time to discuss. Oh, and another um, a small detail. The theme of tonight is open science, and this is kind of a scientific technological campus. But I prefer to talk about open research because it's not only STEM, you know, science, technology, engineering, and maths. It's also social sciences, arts, and humanities that face the same problems. We want to have a more open research environment. Why? I'll talk that about that in a second. And just in the interest of openness, these slides are available under a CC BY license. So feel free to take them, reuse them as much as you want. It's your right. Um, <clears throat> oh, I'm not sure these are the slides I wanted uh, to show. Um, I'll just have to skip a few. So, um, first of all, what is open research and open, open, research and open science? Um, I'll give a general definition, and you know, there are different ways of, of being open. But ideally, an open research and open science environment is one where every research output is free to access, free to use and reuse and mine, and free to disseminate or publish. And when I say free, it's not a matter of money, it's not a matter of I have to pay or not to pay, but it's free as in freedom. Okay. Free to read or access, there shouldn't be any barriers to knowledge, especially if that knowledge is public, the production of knowledge is publicly funded. I should be free, there shouldn't be any barrier for me to access this information, not only to re read it, but to use it and reuse it, whether it's data, whether it's software, or even these papers. I should not be limited in downloading a PDF and reading it. I should have the right to mine the text, to use the text itself to do new research. And I should also have the freedom to dis disseminate my research. Um, I don't know how familiar with you are with open access, but the open access movement has been uh, reused by some commercial entities to maximize their benefits and has, to some extent, become a pay-to-publish model. We need to be very, very careful about that. We also need the freedom to disseminate the research. And another point, a really important one, is that <clears throat> open research should also be inclusive. And I keep that for the very end, because it's a very important point that is not discussed very often. Um, so, open research, open science. Yes, it is important, it's actually crucial. But it's not important just 
for the sake of it. You know, I don't want to be open because it's good to be open. I want to be open because open research is a gateway to better science, to better research. It's a gateway to more trustworthy research. Open research is research that can be reproduced and repeated, as we have seen. And that's a fundamental uh, property of, of science and research. Open research is transparent and honest research. I'm not trying to hide anything. I'm trying to be as open as possible. I might do mistakes. Of course I do mistakes. But you know, I'm honest about it. Open research is research that we can trust and we can build upon. That's why we do open research. It's because, as researchers, we want to produce the best possible research. That is why. Okay. It's quality. Quality through transparency and openness. So open is better, and we should always aim for the better, not the worse. And sometimes I wonder, you know, why do we call it open science? Why don't we just call it science? Right? That's a little bit strange. And actually, there is no such thing as closed science. There is nobody that says, I'm doing closed science, and I will not share it with you, not with you, because it's mine, mine, and only mine. That doesn't exist. I have never met anybody like that. That would be kind of career suicide. So there is a kind of continuum of being very open or not being very, very open. And we need to understand this, and we need to promote openness, because that leads to better research. But so why would anyone not want to do open research? Especially those that do it, the early career researchers. And, and the first time I read this quote by da David Barron, he um, was, I think, a, a computer science professor somewhere in the UK, and he says, well, you know, research, doing research, is the byproduct of researchers getting promoted. Research is not discovering you know, truth, understanding what's around us. Research, or the value that we give in research, is promotion. Well, as an early career researcher, should I not be a docile science or research citizen, you know, and follow the instructions as I'm being told to get promoted? If that's how I will be seen by my peers and by you as a successful scientist, <clears throat> and why is this? You know, what are barriers to being an open researcher? Now, I think these barriers are not technological. The technology is there. It's maybe not perfect, and maybe there are possible techno different technological solutions. But the, the technology, in my opinion, is there. The barriers are social, cultural, and political. Academia <clears throat> has a huge inertia. Why is that? Because the people in charge don't necessarily want to see change. I say that a lot of the stakeholders have vested interest in the system that exists. <clears throat> a lot of the early career researchers fear or think there, is, there are risks, and I think these are perceived fears, of being scooped or not being credited by being open, by disclosing what they do. There is a risk perceived risk that somebody will take it and claim it their own and not give them credit. And that's what we, knew, we need. The currency in research is credit. It's not money. You know, we don't, care, don't really care about the money. I don't want to get rich. The way I get rich as a researcher is by people reading my research and giving me credit for my discoveries. The perceived fears of errors you know, and public humiliation. What if I share my data or my software? I write a lot of software. And somebody suddenly comes and says, there is a bug there. This has happened, and I'm grateful for that. You know, but will I suddenly lose all my credit? You know, some people think there is an information overload. What if instead of just sharing the manuscript at the end, we share the data and everything and everything? There is so much information out there. And really, there is fear of being less competitive in an over-competitive environment. And yet, my opinion is that, especially early career researchers, have to be open scientists. Open science and open research is here, and is here to stay. It's not going to change. On the contrary, research is going to be more and more open. 
And so as early career researchers, if I want to be competitive, I better start early and practice open research. Otherwise, in, I don't know, five years, 10 years, in a generation, I would be completely insignificant if I don't practice open research now. So I think there is a competitive interest to be open. Why do I say that? Well, funders, most cer certainly in the UK, um, want all the publicly funded publications to be open access. So a member of the public should not pay to access the papers. Somebody else pays at the moment. Uh, researchers, when they write grant, have to think about their outputs and write an output management plan, whether it's data, software, antibodies, cell lines. So they need to think in advance what are they going to do, how are they going to share the data. And there are open data mandates where, as a researcher getting public funding, I have to share my data. There is a growing acceptance of open practices like preprints, and, and Jessica will talk about preprints tomorrow. It's a liberating uh, initiative where um, funders accept preprints uh, in, in, in funding applications. The EU has defined an kind of open science career matrix where they define some criteria to judge the people that come and ask for money on open science criteria. That is a big, big change because that's what we want. We want open science to be taken into account in decisions on who gets the money on who gets the job. Um, faculty promotion also starts to think about reproducibility. You know, suddenly, if you do reproducible research, this will count when you look for new jobs. Oh, and here's another very important one. Publishing your data and publishing your research openly gets you more citation for early career researchers. Very, very important. But that sounds all very promising, but let's face it. Currently, I think it's still way too easy to pretend to be an open researcher. Why not trying hard enough? It's still too easy. So maybe we need more than incentives and we need threats. You are not an open researcher, you will not get you any funding. Incentives are not hard enough. So what can we do as early career researchers? We can build openness at the core of our research. Um, Openness won't work as an alpha thought. You have to think about your data sharing, preparing your, your data, annotating and documenting your, your software from the very, very beginning. Otherwise, you, there it's clear that you will fail in open science. Nobody wants to show bad data or bad software. This is something that we need to think about as early career researchers from the very, very beginning. Um, managing data, uh, promoting good data management is a very, very uh, important aspect of doing research, but I think in our academic capacity of peer reviewers, we have an opportunity to favor good open research by requesting data, you know, requesting software in these publications. There is nothing to review if there is no data, if there is no software, is there, if there is no method. It's just black magic. Being reproducible is extremely important for myself. Uh, there is this, this paper published a couple of years ago, Five Selfish Reasons to Work with Reproducibly. I don't want to be reproducible just for the sake of it. I want to be reproducible because it can save my life. It can make me a better researcher, and it, I can produce better research by being reproducible. And no researcher is too junior to fix science. Okay? It's not because you are not an emeritus professor that you should not have a say in how to do the best research. We should all try to fix it, especially early career researchers. And as a matter of fact, most of people that are most active in open research are early career researchers. And unfortunately, all too often, we do not get the support that we need from more senior academics or our institutions. But what can institutions do to help us? There is this bullet into bad science campaign where early career researchers have set a set of points they would want to see institutions to set. The first one is, oh, sorry, is to, um, for institutions to so sign the declaration of research assessment that says that we are not going to assess the quality of research based on the journals where you publish or whatever silly metric that is associated with the journal. 
that is not how we define good research. We're going to look at your research to know if what you do is good and not use where you publish it as a proxy. We also want institutions to positive value commitment to open research and ethical publishing practices. We want them to endorse immediate open access publishing and to support a broader range of research outputs, papers, software, data. We want them to educate researchers. Many, many researchers are not aware of the you know, unethical publishing environment we uh, evolve in. And we want institutions to be transparent when it comes to costs of publishing. And last but not least, we want that early career researchers and postdocs be made full voting members of the institutions. All too often, the early career researchers, do that, that those that do the job, do not have a vote, do not have a word in their own institution. Am I asking for too much? Mm. And last, really important point. There is open science and there is open science. So there is open science as kind of technical aspects of sharing my data, making it as accessible. And there is the, a different, a second open science, which is an open and welcoming science, a diverse science, diverse in terms of outputs, but also diverse in terms of people that can contribute to this science. For a long, long time, I have concentrated on, on the first aspects, the technical, and I thought that the community level openness would follow. Well, I was wrong. I was totally wrong, as uh, put by Cameron Nealon here. The only thing that links all varying strands of open science and open research is inclusion and diversity as a first principle. We should not forget that. I am privileged. I am white, I am a male, and I come from the University of Cambridge. I bet you all have heard from the University of Cambridge. That doesn't make me more intelligent than anyone else because I'm in Cambridge. I was just lucky, you know, for my circumstances allowed me to leave the country where I was, leave the job and go there. I come from a re relatively well-funded lab. That makes me a privileged person. I do not tick all the boxes. I'm only the first generation of people that go to university. Uh, my parents don't have a lot of money to support me in my you know, crazy dreams, but I'm still very, very privileged. Many people do not have this privilege to speak out for open science. Underrepresented minorities are already exposed and under huge pressure. It is perfectly understandable that they do not have the freedom to speak openly for open research which is why I think I have to do it. It is my duty to promote open research for everybody. So let's not forget that open has multiple meanings. Um, so open research is better research, and that's very important. That's what we are striving for. That's why we want, we want to be open. There are different kinds of open, and everybody will be as open as they want to be or as open as they can be, and we need to acknowledge that. And you want to do more? Yes, please. It's very important to have many people that work together to increase openness. But one thing I uh, have learned over the years or I've been promoting open, open research, it's a tough job. You know, you have to pick your battles because there is huge inertia. And it's very easy to be exhausted and demoralized because there is not enough support for early career researchers. But I hope you all kind of join me in promoting open research as much, much as possible. Thank you very much. Questions? Yeah. Thank you for the talk. Um, I think another perceived fear, at least uh, for me as an early career researcher, is um, the privacy when you disclose your data. So I'm actually very scared that I'm violating some sort of rule when I publish a data set. So how can you address that? Yes. Um, so there is certainly critical data, you know, genetic data. Um, we need to be very, very careful. Clinical data, we need to be very, very careful when disclosing that data. Um, I'm not a clinician. I have never, ever seen any data that should not be shared openly for that reason. Now, I'm not a clinician. Surely, you know, if you speak to a clinician, they will have a different point of view. But there are also now efforts 
to um, kind of um, transform that data to still make it uh, publicly available without uh, allowing you know, us to look at the data and trace back where it comes from. So these are certainly real concerns, but they are not a reason for not opening the debate and sharing the data in general. We need to acknowledge that there will be cases where you know, there, is, there are concerns we need to be, to be careful. And if that's your case, that's, you know, I think that's perfectly fine. But generally, these cases are discussed very, very early on when the funding is requested explaining why this data is critical, why it can't be shared, or maybe can only be shared to s with some people. So I would need to request access to get, a, uh, to get access to the data, yes. But in my personal experience, it has never happened. But yeah, it, it's a good point, thank you. Thank you. Um, maybe again at the buffet after <laughs> the third presentation, and please, Benedict, for her. <laughs> 